Good afternoon. This is Michael Ostrelink with the Medical Freedom Report, a project of the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. And I'm speaking with Stefan Kinsella, who's a senior fellow of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, founder and editor of the Libertarian Papers, and the founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. Good afternoon, Stefan. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, Stefan, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, about your work at the Ludwig von Mises Institute and the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. Well, I'm a practicing patent attorney, actually. I'm a general counsel for a private uh, high-tech laser company here in Houston. I've been practicing um, law since 1992, and I've been heavily involved in libertarian and Austrian economic um, theory and and uh, things like that since, uh, since, uh, since, since around that same time. I founded a journal called Libertarian Papers a couple of years ago, which is a scholarly journal which sort of replaced the Journal of Libertarian Studies. And I'm, um, I teach uh, at the Mises Academy, which is an um, online teaching platform of Mises Institute. And I founded the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom uh, last year. To uh, sort of gather a bunch of the world's leading pro-free market but anti-monopoly, anti-intellectual property of scholars together, um, so that we can, uh, you know, gather our resources and provide news and uh, opinions and in, in in upcoming years seminars and uh, other other things like this based upon this idea. Now, can you explain what you mean by the anti-monopoly intellectual property? Yeah, I think the best way to explain it is this. Um, there's sort of been um, – there's a field of law called intellectual property law, which it's very arcane and highly specialized, and not many laymen or non-lawyers know much about it. In fact, not many lawyers who are not specialists know much about it, and even um, – Say trademark lawyers don't know really a lot about patent law quite often, for example. So these are very arcane areas of law, and they're often taken for granted by people that don't know much about them. They just sort of assume this is a type of property law. After all, it's called intellectual property. Um, so intellectual property law is a is a is a type of um, is, is an umbrella term that covers several somewhat related but not completely related. Types of legal rights that the state um, enforces. The primary ones are patent and copyright, and there's also trademark and trade secret. And so you can see right away we're getting to four different types, and there's other types as well, uh, boat hull designs and reputation rights and things like this, um, database rights, moral rights. So it gets it gets to be really complicated. Um, and this is why most people's eyes glaze over they don't understand it but they just sort of assume that it's a type of property right so that if you're in favor of a capitalist private property system then it should probably have some type of intellectual property component although the person saying this usually doesn't know much about it um, but what's interesting is the origin of these systems unlike regular property property and tangible or material things um, arose in the state grants of monopoly and control and censorship, um, copyright and patent in particular, and were never even originally called property. This is a more, a more recent propaganda technique by the state and those who advocate IP law to try to give it the veneer of respectability that regular property rights have by calling it property. Now, I'm a little confused, so hopefully you can clear up my confusion. Um, a lot of the folks that I spend my time with who call themselves libertarians or conservatives support something called intellectual property. And now you're saying it's actually should not it's not shouldn't be supported from a true free market libertarian perspective. Can you explain that? Yeah, so here here's the situation. Um and I I've taken about five or six different approaches to explaining this. I'm a patent lawyer, I'm a I've done copyright, I've done trademark. Um, and trade secret, and I specialize in patent law, so I'm really familiar with the system. I've been doing it since 1993, um, and, and I was – as a libertarian, I always initially assumed that there was some way to justify this, although I was always bothered by it. And so I've looked into it, and over the years I've come to the conclusion that um, you cannot justify these types of laws, and they are contrary to property rights. 
basically what it is is the state grants a, a monopoly right to a person who applies or who does something that the state approves, gives them a right to sue other people for using their own property in a certain way that the holder of this monopoly right um, you know, has not consented to or given permission for. So um, – and, and here's what I think has happened. When the American system was founded, 1776, wherever you date it, um, and the Constitution was enacted in 1789, there was the patent and copyright power granted. Now what happened was there was the Statute of Anne and the Statute of Monopolies in England in the 1600s and 1700s, which were sort of reactions to this English and European um, monarch grant of monopolies and censorship controls. So basically the origin is this. The state, 1600s, 1700s, was really afraid of ideas getting out that they didn't want you know, getting out like Protestantism and, and, or something like that. So Queen Anne establishes the Stationers Guild, which has a monopoly over officially approved ideas because the printing press is starting to really threaten the state. At the same time, monarchs are granting privileges to court cronies, like you can have the monopoly um, of you know making bread or or saddles or whatever in this town. Finally, Parliament responds to these things and starts choking back on them. But when they choke back on them, there was a reaction. So you have the the Statute of Anne, which sort of said, "Look, we're going to get rid of these um, these uh, censorship type monopolies, but we're going to let authors have kind of a remnant of this right." And at the same time, uh, Parliament also said we're going to get rid of the king's and the queen's authority to grant these favoritist monopolies to their court cronies, these privileges, but we're going to make an exception for inventions. So basically these things arose out of court – state grants of monopoly, privilege, and censorship and control, um, and then when the American Revolution um, happens… You know, this, these ideas are in the air, so they put it in the Constitution. There's a clause in there that says Congress has the authority to protect inventions and artistic works. Um, so, but the American Revolution was clothed in the language of natural rights, so everyone assumes that this component of the Constitution, this component of the American system is like one aspect of natural rights or property rights. And then you have theorists like Ayn Rand come along. And she's from Russia. She hates Russia. She sees America as much better. So she basically assumes America is this proto-libertarian paradise, and she takes everything she sees in the Constitution um, as presumptively valid. So she, so she starts pr promoting that, of course, intellectual property law because the Constitution supports it is a type of property right, and of course this is libertarian. So you have these generations of libertarians coming up never really questioning this arcane… Bureaucratic, monopolistic grant by the state uh, that they don't really understand the details of, but because it was part and parcel of this country that they assumed to be the sort of quasi or proto libertarian um, model. So, in recent years, libertarians have begun to question this. They've begun to realize wait a second, we have a state granting monopoly privileges to people. That allows them to use the state's courts to get state force or injunctions or damage awards ordered and issued against other people who are just using their property peacefully, and they're not committing aggression with their property. So you have basically an, an emergence um, among libertarians of uh, a rejection of the IP idea. They're starting to cast off this idea of intellectual property as a legitimate type of private property right. This is Michael Osterlink with the Medical Freedom Report, a project of the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, and I'm speaking with Stefan Kinsella. He's a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, founder and editor of the Libertarian Papers, and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. Uh, Stefan, can you give me an example, a present-day example, um, of, of, of an issue that would kind of highlight what you're talking about? Yeah, I can give you several. I, mean, I have several blog posts. I could, um, you, if you just do a Google search for my name, Kinsella, and uh, trademark patent horror files, I have like a, a post collecting all this. It's on the Mises, Mises.org uh, blog. It's patent and trademark horror files. Um, and you can, in copyright, 
patent, trademark, and trade secret, I can I can give you lots of examples of each one. But let's take a copyright. So the the original purpose of copyright was for the crown to uh, issue a monopoly to one company that it controlled, the stationer's company, so that it can control uh, these printing presses which were starting to emerge and which books would get published. Um, so basically it was used for – literally for censorship purposes. Now today it's been more democratized. It's protected by statute, and there's a bureaucracy in charge of it, and the crown is sort of out of the picture. But the exact same thing still happens, and in fact just recently, a couple of years ago… Uh, there was someone who had written a sort of uh, sequel to The Catcher in the Rye. It was like a parody. Anyway, the estate of J.D. Salinger, the author of that book, sued, and the court issued an injunction to um, the author and the publisher saying that you may not even publish this book. They didn't say you have to pay royalties. They didn't say if you do it, you're going to have to pay a fine or a penalty. They said you may not do it under penalty of contempt of court. So basically what you have is the court using the force of the state to enjoin free speech. Someone could not comment on this, and there's other examples too. Uh, there was a film called Nosferatu, a Dracula film that was ordered – all copies were ordered destroyed by the court. Um, there was a parody of um, Gone with the Wind called The Wind Done Gone, which was uh, prohibited by injunction. So that's the copyright case. In terms of patent, uh, this is a regular thing. You have uh, companies on a regular basis who are afraid to innovate in or enter into a given market for fear of a patent lawsuit. Um, if you remember a few years ago um, there, when we had the anthrax scare in Congress, uh, and there's one drug called Cipro, which is authorized by the patent holder. There, there was not enough drugs being made, so Congress threatened to use its authority… To grant a license, see, because see, the federal government grants these patent monopolies, but then they claim the authority to grant an exception to it when they need to. It's called a compulsory license. So they threatened the maker of Cipro with, look, we're going to authorize other people to make this drug if you can't make enough. So the company backed down. Um, another case was the BlackBerry case when um, uh, the maker of BlackBerry was threatened with patent infringement, and they were threatened with being shut down. By the um, by, the plaintiff holding a patent, um, congressmen had blackberries, and they were very fond of their blackberries. And when their interests were threatened, you know, they threatened to institute a compulsory monop uh, compulsory license yet again to get out of it. But what happened was, um, Rim, who makes BlackBerry, they were sued by a company called NTP. Rim agreed to pay six hundred and twelve million dollars. This was like three or four years ago, just to settle the suit. This was even though the patents were being challenged in court at the time, but the problem is so long as they're not yet invalidated by a court, the co another court could issue an injunction and in shutting the entire BlackBerry operation down. Um, so these are examples of basically how patents are used as extortion threats by competitors. What they are basically is a patent is a way that a company who does not like competition can use the power of the state… To help get rid of competition, and what you have, um, Michael, is you have a lot of medium to large size companies like my own accumulating dozens or hundreds or thousands of patents almost completely defensively, and they use these things to threaten their competitors with a counter lawsuit if they get sued. So the larger and medium sized companies don't sue each other for patent infringement because they know they'll be countersued, so they enter into either… A silent or an explicit uh, sort of gentleman's agreement not to sue each other, or they license each other their technology. But what this does is it creates sort of a walled garden or a barrier to entry to smaller companies that don't have any patents because they're like naked. They don't have any defense to a patent suit from these guys that have all these patents. So basically patents are a clearly explicitly anti-competitive um, grant of monopoly privilege by the state. And it's a little bit obscene and absurd that it is uh, that this uh, terrible anti-free market, anti-private property practice has been co-opted by the state and has bamboozled libertarians into thinking it's part of libertarianism. Uh, but now we're starting to wake up. Well, let me ask you a question. Let's assume for the moment one of our doctors um, writes a book uh, 
develops some software benefiting his practice as a doctor um, and perhaps creates a new drug or a new, a new technology for medicine. And you can use any one of these three or all three of these examples. Um, he spends or she spends a lot of time, effort, and money to, to do so. Wouldn't that individual have an interest in having their time and resources protected, at least for a certain amount of time, um, as opposed to someone else being able to just come in and utilize their, their thinking for their own benefit at the expense of the person who spent all the time and effort putting into developing a product or you know something along those lines? So here's how I would approach that. First of all, yes, they have an interest, but then um, you know, um, um, senior citizens have an interest in getting Social Security payments. Um, welfare recipients have an interest in getting welfare payments. Um, Halliburton has an interest in the um, uh, you know the welfare warfare state. So the fact that someone has an interest, uh, you know, to me is not really um, determinative. The question is yeah. what is just and mm-hmm. what is property rights and. As a libertarian, as someone interested in property rights and justice and fairness and freedom in a free market, we have to step back and ask what is the function and purpose of a government? The only possible function of government is to do justice, and we libertarians believe that's done in a particular way, which is to protect property rights. Property rights in, 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 in the libertarian conception, which is to enforce the rights of people to scarce resources that they have a legitimate title or claim to. The purpose of the state and the government and justice cannot be to have a group of bureaucrats that sit um, in some city and try to determine what rules that they can decree and enforce to maximize the production of certain arbitrarily decreed goals or goods. So the purpose of the state is not to make sure that we have enough innovation. The purpose of the state is not to make sure that we have enough um, music being produced. The purpose of the state, if anything, is to just protect and defend property rights. So to argue that there is a copyright or a pattern, you have to argue that it's a property right, not that someone has an interest in it, and not that the state ought to be tweaking these things to maximize these other things. Not to mention that all of the studies that have been done, even if you take this sort of utilitarian perspective, which I do not take… But even if you take this perspective that you know we should try to be, uh, have the state adopt rules that maximize wealth or utility or whatever whatever thing you want to maximize, all of the studies that have been done by just mainstream empirical um, uh, economists and others conclude that these IP laws, there's no proof that they actually do what they claim to do. Um, by all lights, they're clear, they clearly distort the market for culture. Creativity and innovation. They distort it by, by pushing research from one to the other, things that can be protected. Um, and there's evidence that it actually reduces overall innovation. So, so that would be my first argument. That, and so you take your doctor. I, I think the way to look at things is this. In life and in, in, in a free market society, it is the job of the actor, the human actor, the entrepreneur, to figure out what end he wants to achieve. And how to make a profit off of it. And if part of that involves the use of your creative energy, innovation, then it's up to you to figure out how to make a profit of it. Let, let me give a brief example. Back in the 50s, if, if you remember, dr- drive-in theaters were more popular in the U.S. than they are now. And as we all recall them, you drive in, you pull up next to these little tin set of speakers, and you listen to the movie. Now, why did they do this? They did this because initially they didn't have little speakers. They had a big loudspeakers. But you have people who would drive up and have free riders, and they would just sit on the neighboring hills or on their cars, and they would watch the, the outdoor screen and listen to the outdoor speakers, and they would get to benefit from the uh, performance for free. Now, the, the drive-in movie theaters could have lobbied Congress for a law to make it illegal to sit on your own property on your own porch and watch your screen… But instead what they did was they got creative, and they said, listen, we need to find a way to exclude enough of these free riders to make a profit. So they installed the, the speakers uh, that are per car speakers, cost some money. They have to also install a ticket booth, and they ha- a person they have to hire someone to make sure uh, you only come in if you paid a price. This is the way the business world works. If you're selling something that's a bundle of service and content… And a scarce resource, you have to find a way to make a profit. That's the entrepreneur's job, and in that case, they did it. So 
There's a lot of research, a lot of studies about how people can do these things. I can't answer all of them, but the point is, is the you know if you release into the public um, an idea or information, other people are going to learn from it and compete with you. That's what competition is. All libertarians believe in competition. Someone has an idea for a new type of business or restaurant. They come into town. You know, they have a movie theater. They have a new drugstore. They have a Walmart or a chain store. They have wider aisles in the grocery stores, whatever. Their competitors are continually eyeing them, and they emulate what works, and they maybe improve on it. In this way, competitors are always on their toes, and consumers are always made better off. But you can't release, say, a new product into the world like a new mousetrap and expect people not to learn from what you've done. Now, in terms of another example, um, I'd, I'd be curious on your take on, for instance, music. So I download my favorite song, um, and I think what I hear you saying is since I own it, since I paid for it, I can pretty much do anything I want to now with it. Is that correct? Well, I wouldn't actually put it that way. I'm, I, would, I would be more careful about what ownership means and whether you can own a song. A song is a pattern of information. And I don't think it can be owned. Ownership applies to scarce resources, which people can um, can fight over or conflict over. Now, I would say that if you actually download a song in a legal way, um, and you uh, whether you pay a price for it or whether it's free, if you agree to a contract with the seller, then you can bind yourself or become liable for doing things that you agreed not to do. So, if a seller of a song offers it on its site and says, "Listen." You can download this, but you have to click on this box and agree not to give it to your friends. Well, then if you do so, you're, you're, you're in contract breach. It's still not a property issue in terms of the song, but it's just a breach of a contract. But the problem is that contractual approach to copyright and patent is very limited in how much you can apply it. IP, copyright, and patent apply to third parties who have not agreed to anything. And if unless you can somehow have this legal system apply to third parties, then you cannot have anything resembling modern patent and copyright. Now, I understand you're teaching a class at the Mises Academy on this very issue. Is that correct? Well, I taught a course on intellectual property theory, history, and economics um, last fall. I am currently teaching a course on libertarian legal theory, but I will be repeating my IP course uh, in March on Mises Academy. Now, if, if our doctors and their patients are interested in, in listening to and participating in these programs or these programs of yours, how they find out more about them? They can go to academy.mises.org, and um, you know the examples you gave earlier were interesting because you mixed several things together because there are intellectual property touches almost all of these things. You mentioned a book. Mm-hmm. Software and in a, in a pharmaceutical and an invention. Actually, what you mentioned uh, involves at least four or five types of intellectual property rights. The book would be copyright. The software would be copyright protected and potentially patent protected. The pharmaceutical would be protected by patents, and the innovate invention, like a medical device or even a medical technique, would be covered by patents. And some of this might be covered by trade secrets. So you have the interplay of all these arcane. Um, ultra uh, uh, kind of particularistic bodies of law um, that are hard for people to understand. Um, and in fact, you might find this of interest. Um, in I think in '95 or so, there was a an amendment to the patent law passed. And of course, the patent law is always being changed because of different lobbyists and interest groups. And there was an exception made to the ability of the medical profession to enforce medical procedure patents. With an injunction. So, in other words, the fear was that a doctor would invent a new technique for performing surgery, a technique now, that's a process, and he would patent it. And then he could actually get an injunction from a court telling one of his fellow doctors, you cannot even use this technique to save someone's life. So, probably because of the potential public outcry from this and the Hippocratic Oath idea, right? That you know, we're in this to save people's lives. Why would I stop someone from? Using a technique to help someone, um, an exception was carved out of the patent law that said doctors cannot use an injunction to enforce a medical procedure patent, but you can still use it to enforce medical device patents, right? And and uh, healthcare healthcare providers can be sued, but not doctors. I mean, it's 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 
these types of examples are rampant in the patent law, and it's very much akin to the income tax code. It's full of completely arbitrary um, exceptions and details that are the result of compromises and basically bribery and uh, pressure groups. But it sort of indicates to someone, is the idea of patent law really a natural right? Is it really something that's compatible with property rights in our nature if Congress makes up these arbitrary rules and exceptions all the time just to prevent, to prevent its excesses from being too unpalatable to the medical profession or to people in general? Now, your, your Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, that organization itself, um, looks at and, and articulates these kind of ideas that, you're with, that we've been discussing. Is that correct? Yes, with a focus on what institutional practices and rules ought we to have in society to uh, foster innovation and not to hamper innovation. And a key aspect of this is the, um, uh, the very damaging effect of intellectual property law on innovation itself. Uh, and basically, we have this perverse situation where people assume that patent law, for example, it complements innovation and spurs innovation and is necessary for innovation. But the exact opposite is true on every one of those mainstream assumptions. Now, if, when our doctors are interested to learn more about your center, how they find it on the web? So our website is C4, that's the number four, C4SIF.org. And you're also the founder and editor of the Libertarian Papers. Where would folks go to find that as well? That's libertarianpapers.org. This is a scholarly libertarian journal which um, succeeded the closing of the Journal of Libertarian Studies about two years ago. Well, Stefan, thank you very much. This is really interesting, and uh, perhaps we can have another discussion in the near future and kind of unfold these ideas even further. Michael, I'd be really happy to. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it.